important. We think from all our research that uh, this may be the only program of its type in the area that is one that discusses education issues both by interviewing guests and also by having call-ins from our listeners. We want to give you the number right away today because we're going to be having your phone calls interspersed throughout uh, and that number is 510-848-4425. That's 510-848-4425. And you're welcome to call in. I'm going to tell you a couple of topics that have come up in the news, and those are topics that you might want to address. And then I'm going to raise a real big issue for everybody to talk about a little bit later in the program. Um, the first piece of education news that's important uh, in this community is the fact that the California State Assembly has now uh, passed in one of its committees, uh, started moving legislation forward authored by Assembly Member Sa- Sandra Swanson to begin the return of local control to the school district. A lot of people went to Sacramento on Wednesday, um, and they, uh, this included school board members, union members, parents, many people went there. Uh, Sandra Swanson's bill, AB 45, uh, is one that would, uh, take steps, more steps that are be- currently being taken to, um, return the, uh, school district to local control. As you probably remember from other programs on this uh, station, the uh, Oakland School District was taken over by the state. There were actually three attempts to take over the school district, and the first two did not involve any deficit, uh, just seemed, in my opinion, to be a sort of naked power grab. Uh, the first one in 1988 and then a later one in 1999. But ultimately, the maneuverings around the school district led to a deficit and the way uh, the state of California operates, if a school district's budget is not balanced, the state takes over, appoints someone to administer the school district, and then uh, is supposed to lead the school district back to financial recovery. Uh, of course, though, we know that the school district has not been returned to financial recovery. And so then the question becomes, when will the district ever be returned to local control since it has dropping enrollment, dropping resources and a sort of structure that uh, says you have to be great at all these different items to get back local control, uh, which is in itself kind of problematic. I want to give you the phone number again and then explain a little bit more about what the problematic parts of this are. Uh, the telephone number again is 510-848-4425, and you're welcome to call in to talk about this or other items. So um, the problem with the uh, possibility of returning local control to Oakland is that the way the bill was written – uh, to take over the school district, there is no way to get back local control except for the state superintendent of education, Jack O'Connell, to give back control. He's essentially the only person who is able to do that. And since he isn't elected from Oakland, it's hard to hold him accountable. Now, of course, he probably will want to run for a statewide elected office, and maybe he'll care about the uh, voters of Oakland if we can be loud enough, but uh, it doesn't make him as directly accountable as a local school board. And the other factor that's difficult is that this agency called the FISC, FICMAT, it's referred to as FICMAT, is the one that gets to grade the school district on a pretty abstract set of criteria. So we have our first caller now, Heather from Guerneville, I believe. Welcome to the program, Heather. Hi. Hi, how are you? Pretty good. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that um, I've discussed with my son. My son is a kindergarten teacher in San Francisco, and um, one of the things that he has told me that really surprised me is the number of hours that um, K-12 through teachers are putting in in order to just, just get their work done. Um, they're putting in 12-hour days. Absolutely. And I, I I was surprised, and whenever I mention that to anyone, they're just, you know, shocked at that. Um, and so what what um, his school did when the teachers went on strike last year, instead of going on a full strike, they simply worked the number of hours that their contract called for. Right. Um, which I thought was a really interesting way of dealing with the situation. Right. And they were, they were able to get it resolved, thank goodness. But... Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention um, is how um, 
kids get diagnosed with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. He has several in his class right now. And one of the issues that comes up a lot with him is that because it is a kindergarten class and a lot of times it's the first time that parents have have been um, confronted with the idea that perhaps their child might have a learning disability, um, that in itself is difficult to work with. But... On top of that, the other people in the system at his particular school <clears throat> are um, actually diagnosing these kids instead of uh, an expert doing that, and he caught them at it. Mm. And um, anyway, the situation is basically they don't like each other anymore mm -hmm. because he had the guts to do that, and you know, because he cares about the kids and wants them to get you know, help when they need help so that it doesn't bother them all the way through school. Thank you, Heather. That's a, Those are examples of two really important problems that we find in schools. Um, the one is that actually American teachers work much longer than, uh, much longer hours than teachers in some other school districts around the world, uh, in other countries. Um, and uh, in other countries, it's common for teachers, for example, to work in the morning and then have the afternoon time for collaborating with other teachers, for doing their lesson planning and so on. If you do any extensive amount of lesson planning as a teacher in the United States, you do have to work something like a 12-hour day because, you know, of course, as you know, with kindergarten, first grade, you have to create manipulatives. You can't just talk at the kids, and you shouldn't be talking at the kids when they're in the 10th and 11th grade either. So creating those things does take time. And I would also say on the learning disability issue that, yes, I agree people shouldn't be diagnosed by someone who's not a professional at that. But the other question is, uh, I think we may be creating a lot of our special ed learning disability uh, issues by the fact that we have pushed the curriculum to the point that kids are being asked to do things that they are not developmentally prepared to do. So, of course, if you can't read at, you know, age four and a half or five, and that's the expectation, then there's a whole lot of inclination to start calling you learning disabled when maybe if you left the kids to read at the time that kids are actually able to, you wouldn't have that problem. So thank you for your call, Heather. And we now have a caller from Livermore, Paul from Livermore. Hi, Kitty. Hi, Paul. Boy, this is a great program. Thank I'll you. I have to say. And uh, <laughs> there should be more of them. My my 16-year-old, he was about to be 17, actually. In Livermore, he was uh, literally kicked out of every possible alternative for uh, insubordination and, you know, on and on and on. And then he w checked himself into a rehab place in Santa Cruz and... So now he's on independent study, and he sees a teacher one hour every couple weeks. What do you think about that? I'm I'm so sorry, and I I really <laughs> you know I I don't I think... used to go to school every day. Right, and and we need schools that that work for the kids for for our kids. We don't need to be making schools that work for adults and putting kids out to be, you know, independent study for for a student who's been turned off to school, they're not going to be doing any independent study. I mean, independent study is hard enough when you're a grown-up. I've had graduate students who can't do independent study because they're, you know, they're not motivated and socially connected enough. So to have a young person doing that, I think is uh, terrible. And thank you very much for your call. Our next caller is Sandre Swanson, the author of the bill I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, the uh, local control of the school district is one of the issues I care most passionately about, which you probably, if you've listened to this program more than once, you probably know that. But I wasn't able to go to Sacramento on Wednesday and see what happened with Sandre's bill, so I'm really anxious to hear from him what happened. Welcome, Sandre. Uh, thank you, Kitty. So tell us what happened with the bill, what was the reaction, how, how do you feel, and who was there, and so on. Well, I really appreciate the fact that a number of parents and, and, and students uh, came to Sacramento. Um, uh, the vice mayor, uh, Gene Kwan, was there, and the president of the school board, David Kakashiba, he was there and presented. Uh, it was the first, uh, it was our first opportunity to present AB 45 before the Assembly Education Committee, and uh, I was uh, pleased that it passed the Assembly Education Committee with a 7-2 vote.
and so that was uh, that was that was uh, very exciting, and it means that um, the bill is well on its way through the legislative process. Do you predict that it will ultimately pass both the Assembly and the Senate? Well, I do. I, I, we got a call from uh, Senator Prada's office, and the senator is uh, is uh, supporting the bill, and will support the bill when it uh, reaches the um, the Senate. Uh, we had um, only one speaker in opposition to the bill, really, and that was a representative from uh, the state superintendent uh, O'Connell's office. Wow, he and, seems outnumbered, huh? That's uh, good. <laughs> well, I was very disappointed actually with the um uh with his decision to oppose our bill for a couple of reasons. Uh first of all, uh I met with uh, with Superintendent O'Connell uh earlier uh in the year and I asked him very specifically for uh any suggestions uh, to our legislation uh for him to give us any written amendments that he felt uh, would be helpful uh, to moving this process along. And I also met three times with uh, the Oakland um, uh, administrator, Dr. Statham, uh, with the same request, and I never got one uh, suggestion. Mm. And then so for us to, on as we're presenting our bill, to, to receive objections, I was very disappointed in that. Uh, the second reason I was disappointed in, in his opposition, uh, uh, even though it was not successful at the committee level, was because under current law, the state superintendent uh, has all the powers vested in him that are necessary for us to move for a smooth transition of the school district back to local control right now. And so for him to oppose my bill, which is designed to go into effect in March of 2008, I'm just worried that that sends a signal that his office plans to do nothing between now and March of 2008 wow. to move the district forward. What else wow. can it mean? Because uh, if, if, if he was committed to this process, then his office without any legislation, could actually work with the Oakland School Board and start transferring authority. So I hope that his opposition doesn't mean that, uh, but I was disappointed. Uh, say that aside, he has his responsibilities, and we have ours as legislators. But, but as you've pointed out uh, uh, on your program, this is supposed to be about the education of our children, and so AB 45 is an attempt to return local control so that parents and students and teachers can hold a school board accountable for the education decision of our children. Hey. Thank you. I, can I ask you a couple more questions? Sure. I just wonder if you have any any insight into why the super, state superintendent might be opposing the bill. Do you do you have any clue? Well, I think that uh, I think that there's a there's a, a flaw in the law as it relates to how uh, troubled school districts um, are returned. Uh, back to local control. When you appoint uh, through legislation the state superintendent's office to manage a, di a district, and uh, and then the district is evaluated based on the state superintendent's office effectiveness of of reorganizing the district. Uh, and at a time when it's when you have to start talking about transferring of authority, it, it, there is almost an inherent conflict of interest because. As they're working on this project, they have to sort of work themselves out of a job. Right. And so I think that what we've tried to to do through AB 45 in terms of a remedy, uh, we now have set up a process by which, uh, through our legislation, uh, uh, FISMAC, the uh, Physical Crisis Management Assistance Team, will uh, score the district. And in those areas where they recommend that that authorities be returned, then those authorities shall be returned, and that the school board and the superintendent would then uh, talk about which which authorities should be transferred, and if there's a disagreement, then the superintendent would have to go to an administrative law judge to to argue their point. But the district uh, would be a co-equal partner in determining. Uh, which authorities should come back, and then those authorities would go into effect by the beginning of the school year in July. And so uh, we wanted to make sure this, this process was transparent 
And so I think part of his objection is that the school board uh, will not, it will no longer be in a helpless position to negotiate uh, which authorities are returned. Uh, up until this point, uh, FISMAC has said for the last year and a half that the Oakland School Board is ready to receive the authorities of governance and community relations, but the superintendent hasn't returned those authorities. In his judgment, they're not ready. So who resolves that impasse? I see. So my bill now makes it so that the school board and the superintendent would enter into a negotiation around their authority. Uh, the school board, if the, if the superintendent doesn't accept the school board's definition of authority, then he can appeal that um, that definition. But the school board, the burden of proof would be on the superintendent to challenge the school board. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we would we would move forward. And so I would anticipate next year, with the successful passage of this bill, that Oakland Unified School District will be looking at the question of hiring a superintendent and also looking closely at uh, all the other uh, rights uh, and authorities that are properly evaluated uh, and is determined that they're competent to perform those duties. Every year for the last three years, Oakland School District has improved on its evaluation and its, and its report of, uh, of its competence. And so I anticipate... Um, in March, when we've ordered uh, for the next review to 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 be presented, that at that time there will be additional authorities given to the board, and that uh, we will have a functioning board and moving toward a completely functioning board starting uh, starting next year. And we're doing it for the children. Do just one last quick question. Sure. Um, I understood uh, in a conversation with you some weeks or months ago that you were also. Uh, head of a special select committee that's yes. uh, doing hearings around the state on takeovers? Is yes. that right? We're, yes, I am. The, uh, Speaker uh, Fabian Nunez was, was uh, kind enough to appoint me as the chair of the select committee on statewide school closures. And as our legislative agenda slows down, as we get most of our bills through this session, we're going to start with field hearings in Oakland and Richmond and other communities that have been faced with school closures to examine exactly what has been taking place. What is this, what is the Office of Education been doing to help these districts uh, return back to local control? The motivating uh, the, the, the motivating force behind our interest here is that in Oakland, for instance, there's a school board that's been elected by the voters. Schools are supposed to be our greatest example of democracy, mm -hmm. and when 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 people elect a school board, they should be able to hold that school board accountable and it ought to have authority. And so that's what we're trying to determine, that when school boards are ready and whether or not there's a transparent process by which local communities can can participate and hold their school board accountable. It's very difficult to hold the uh, state superintendent's office uh, accountable uh, for decisions of who should be the principal, what schools should close, and the like. And parents just want to know that they have a, a say in those decisions. It's it's it couldn't. There's no more important uh, decision that, that that parents are are interested in than that of the education of their children. Well, it sounds like you're getting some support in Sacramento for yeah. a different view of of school takeovers because yeah. uh, with that kind of a vote in the Assembly uh, Education Committee, it seems like some other uh, legislators are hearing you. Yeah. So uh, we're very happy for that and happy to have you in Sacramento. And thanks for calling in, Sandra. It's wonderful news. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your work with the program. We need these voices out there uh, making education a priority for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we now have. I want. I want to move. Uh, introduce another topic if uh, if callers want to address it, and that is something which our producer has been encouraging us to talk more about, and that is what we think schools should look like. We do spend a lot of time, important time, on on what shouldn't be happening, but what do we think schools should like look like? What uh, and and do we have any ideas about how we might get there? Uh, in fact. Um, uh, Kevin Cartwright, our producer, has introduced this idea to me of something he calls radioactive. 
um, meaning the uh, kind of use of, of radio in a way that's active to try to make change. And uh, so we're talking about maybe doing a uh, program from Sacramento one day where we could be up there on a, on a, on the right moment, the right day, um, with people lobbying their legislators and interviewing people in Sacramento about some of these education bills that are going through. So if you have ideas and thoughts uh, about that question of what schools should look like and how we might be able to get there, we'd love to hear from you and our Phone number is 848-4425. And now I believe we have a caller from Oakland. Jaron from Oakland. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm wonderful. Um, well, I had a, actually a comment and a question about your um, earlier um, comments about school takeovers. I think it's important to use language which actually describes what's what's happening and what position students are put into. I think we should actually call these a holocaust because they come in and take over schools and are killing children's minds in the in the schools one and also taking the money which is supposed to go towards educating the our children which is not happening at the moment and I think that there's a, a direct correlation between the taking the takeover of the schools and the increase in the murder rate in in Oakland which I think should be addressed. Very very uh in- interesting important point that if it certainly is a factor that if young people don't have anything to do and they're being sort of pushed out of school that there's a lot more likely that to be getting involved in things which will lead to uh violence against them. Um, because they're not occupied in a way that feels productive. And at a very early age, their sense of uh, possibility, of dreams, of hopes gets crushed by the fact that, you know, many kids are already, by the time they're in eighth or ninth grade, essentially being pushed out of school because they're not passing whatever the latest test is and so on. And certainly uh, state control of the schools doesn't help in that regard. I think the locally controlled schools in Oakland did try to resist some of the overuse of testing, not that they had, you know, a lot of control over it. A lot of that comes from state and federal government, but I think there is more likely to be resistance when you do have uh, schools that are run by the local community. Our next caller uh, is Betty from Oakland, and again, our telephone number is 848-4425, and you're listening to Education Today, and we discuss issues in uh, in education, both problems and also we want to talk about possibilities. How should the schools be different? Welcome, Betty. Hi, Kitty. This is Betty from uh, President of the Oakland Education Association. Wonderful. And I bet you were in I, Sacramento the other day. Yes, I was, and I was um, excited that I got to testify 30 seconds of <laughs> time in support of Assembly Bill 45. We're very excited that there is a movement toward return of local control, although I, I do have to say that I'm I'm concerned about the the influence that FICMAT will have, but I think that just means we have to be really make sure that we really stay on their case so that it doesn't become a self-perpetuating thing where we just never get out of local uh, out of state control and i think many things that i really want to express my appreciation to assembly member swanson because i think he has really taken this forward he put it as a bill he um, brought it forward on the very first day after he's inaugurated and um want to call on him to um convene hearings, as he said he would, around school closures, around the state takeover. We're, we're actually calling for, for a hearing in the next month or so so that students and parents and teachers can give their testimony about what it really is like. And you've mentioned so many of the things that happen, both under state takeover and under the conditions of sanctions and punishments from No Child Left Behind. I was in a school this morning, and a wonderful teacher, but really forced into a very scripted mode by the kind of curriculum that teachers are forced to do, the kind of testing teachers are forced to do. And uh, when you ask for what schools should look like, I think that's, that's such a wonderful question because they need to be places of, of real learning and connection for students, not, not some decision by a publisher or by a legislator on what children should learn and how they should be tested. They're not 
They're not little widgets that can be put into a box, and they need to have their hearts and souls connected to what they're learning, and that's being taken out of education. Wow, hearts and souls connected to what they're learning. Certainly not anything I've been reading in any of the scripts lately about what's supposed to be happening in school. I want to ask you one more uh, question before I let you go, Betty. I I was very proud to discover a a couple of weeks ago that the Oakland Education Association, I live in Oakland, so I'm I'm proud when when (laughs) things happen in Oakland, uh, became the first um, local to endorse something which I think is called the Educators' Roundtable Petition uh, against the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind, which we've also talked about quite a bit on this program. That's the federal law, which is responsible for quite a lot of the scripted curriculum testing, school closings, and so on. So if you could just uh, tell us quickly, is that right? You did endorse it, and where could people find more information? Is there a website or something if people want to get involved themselves in that petition? Yes, indeed. I really encourage people to sign it. We we are indeed the first local in the country to officially endorse the Educator Roundtable pe- petition online. You can reach it at Educator Roundtable, all one word. Dot. Oh gosh, I don't know if it's dot com or dot org. Try both. I think it's dot org. And there is a petition. There's all kinds of information about the the absolute negative effects of testing, scripted learning, their ideas on opposing No Child Left Behind. You know, it's up for reauthorization this year. Um, People to write to. George Miller, congressman in our local Richmond area, is one of the original authors of the bill, and he continues to maintain that it's a good thing. So we really, really need people to, to understand how this law is really taking away the learning from education, and it's replacing it with test preparation and fear and children hating school, as the the caller before me so so eloquently said, the connection between violence and what's happening in our schools is a direct one. And I need to say that, that teachers, most teachers I talk to just feel such utter devastation about what's happening in education. They're not doing it willingly, but there needs to be need to get away to get people to finally say, we will not do this anymore. The Hippocratic Oath for Doctors says, I will not willingly, I will not knowingly harm my patient. We need to be able to say, I will not knowingly harm a child, and that's what we, we're being complicit as long as we do. Wow, there's a powerful idea for uh, our thing about what what can we do about this. The idea of a Hippocratic Oath for uh, teachers may be something valuable to put into the teacher education credential program, something good good to fight for and i think i do hope people will check out the educator um roundtable. educator roundtable because uh i think that po- petition does seem powerful yes. the education educator roundtable.org thank you uh people in the station have found us out the right uh place to go um i also wanted to mention i sometimes mention this book uh which i wrote about a year ago, uh, which talks a lot about all these issues, testing, no child left behind, and so on. It's called A Different View of Urban Schools, Civil Rights, Critical Race Theory, and Unexplored Realities. It's from Peter Lang, and it's available on Amazon.com. We have one last very quick caller. If we can just hear a minute from you, Susan, welcome to Education Today. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with the non I'm a child welfare worker, and it's kind of common knowledge in our world that it would take two times as many child welfare workers and three to do the job, and three times to do it according to best practices. So what I'm hearing about the schools, and I remember when I was at the um, Labor Council, the Central Labor Council, seeing the, the disastrous underfunding of maintenance services, of all kinds of stuff, could we have a united front for child care? child welfare, decent juvenile justice and schools where we say children have to come first in this country? Sounds like a wonderful idea, and that's all the time we have for this call. Um, Our programs air on the second and fourth Fridays of each month. Uh, You're listening to Education Today. Uh, I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein. The producer for Education Today is Kevin Cartwright. The board op for today's program is Erica Bridgman. I'm your host, Kitty Kelly Epstein, and we'll be talking with you again soon. Thanks.
Internet radio broadcasting is in serious danger due to a recent decision by the Copyright Royalty Board. Internet broadcasters, including non-commercial stations like KPFA, are facing a dramatic increase in the royalties they must pay to the recording industry for the songs that listeners hear on their websites. Many Internet radio stations now face bankruptcy. If you value the programming that you get on kpfa.org, 